Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome, I don't want to make you stand up the whole time. Why don't I? Let us pray. O oh God of timeless grace, we are filled with joyful expectation. So we pray that you would help us to hear the message that points to and prepares the way so that with holy joy we may eagerly await the kingdom of your Son, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Krauser family lit the candles. We realize that today is the second Sunday of Advent. And the word of God is announced to us as written in the prophet of Isaiah and fulfilled in the ministry of John the Baptist. Long ago, God declared, See, I am sending my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make its paths straight. Prepare the way of the Lord. It's the message of John the Baptist. Now, as we talked about with the children, John the Baptist was quite the character. He went around the wilderness of Judea yelling and screaming, Repent, the kingdom of God is at hand. Prepare the way of the Lord. Make his path straight. We discuss that he dressed funny. Camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist. He ate strange food. Bugs, locusts, honey. But all of this strangeness, strangeness of this character is really insignificant because his job, his purpose was to get the people of Israel ready for Jesus. Now John was not your average preacher. He was not well behaved. He was not refined, nor was he dignified. He did not conduct proper liturgies in a beautiful church sanctuary. He did not stand behind a pulpit, a nice pulpit like this, when he spoke. His messages were not particularly sophisticated. They were not highly intellectual. And those who listened were not sitting in the pews of a well-appointed sanctuary. Now you see, John preached his message anywhere and to everyone, all across the Judean countryside. And as we heard, his message was plain and simple. I am not the one, because the one who is to come is more powerful than I am. In other words, you're going to have to wait for the real one. Now, if there's one word most of us really don't like, it's wait. I hate to wait. I imagine most of you are the same. You hate to wait. Now let me give you an example that pertains to our church. Real life example. And it's literally Simon. Simon is not the next rector of our church. But Simon is preparing the way for the next rector of our church. For the one who is to come. No matter how much we appreciate Simon, he's not the one. But the one who is to come, we've got to wait for. And the waiting all happens while the church search committee does their work. Now, currently, the search committee is working on what we call the profile. The profile is a huge document that is like a job description. It tells candidates who we are as a church, 
and what we're looking for in our next rector. But soon, that profile will go live, and the search committee will shift from being one producing documents to one that read documents. And let's hope and let's pray we receive a whole lot of applicants. But who knows? Who knows who will be interested in coming to our unique dual denomination congregation? And so we wait, and we wait, and waiting is difficult. We wait for the one who is to come. Now some of you may be saying, this period of time of waiting is passive. We can't do anything. All we do is wait. Because we can't do anything to help the process along. We can't go beat the bushes for Episcopal priests. We can't put more shine on the profile. We can't speed up the organ construction process to make everything just so for the one who is to come. That's not totally accurate. Because actually, this period of waiting is not passive at all. Because we have some things we must do and some things that we can do and let me explain. Is not passive because we must pray. And I don't say that lightly. Pray every day for the search committee, for their work, for the process. But most importantly, pray for the one who is to come. Pray every day for the yet unknown one who is to come, that he or she will be open to an ecumenical congregation that he or she will be interested in sharing leadership, promoting the mission and the ministry of our church. And the next thing we can and we must do is get our house in order. Get our house in order. This is where we all can pitch in. This is where it becomes active waiting, not passive. Volunteer, get involved. Serve on a committee. Yes, yes, serve on a committee. It's, it will help. It will help. Get involved in the life of the mission outside the church. IPM, Found House, Matthew 25, Transforming Jail Ministries, 2020 Youth Detention Center, and on and on and on. So when the one who is to come shows up, things work well. Things look great. It all runs smoothly. It's a well-oiled machine that anyone would want to come and be our rector. Oh, and by the way, I didn't mention, we also have another important search going on for a new Christian educator. Jennifer Taylor, who has led us for 12 years, will be leaving us this summer to move to Austin, Texas, to be with her family. And when she goes, there'll be huge shoes to fill. Again, it's not a passive time of waiting. We must pray for the one who is to come to fill them, and we must do work to prepare the way. Clearly, I'm not equating these two search processes with the coming of baby Jesus. <laughs> Maybe not. But they're important. They're important to the life of our church, to our future, just as waiting for Jesus to be born in a manger. You get my point. We don't have a choice but to wait. However, we can choose how we will wait. And that's my point. We can wait passively. Sit down on the couch and wait for Christmas this morning to come, or we can get involved. We can get out of the pew and get involved in the waiting, the action of waiting. As I've pointed out, there are two different kinds of waiting. There's active and passive. Passive being that pointless, 
exercise we all have to endure. All I have to do is mention the Bureau of Motor Vehicles and you get my point. You're waiting for your number to be called to come up and get a new driver's license. But there is another kind of waiting that matters. Like waiting in the doctor's office for the results of the biopsy. Or waiting to see the ultrasound of your yet unborn child. Waiting is difficult. Most of us think of waiting as empty and pointless. However, as we just found out, some waiting is significant. It really does matter because it gives us time. Time to prepare, time to get things in order, time to be ready. Be ready for the one who is to come. And that's what Advent is. We have these candles here to count down the Sundays till Christmas. And we often think of that as a passive waiting for Christmas morning. We have to wait to sing Christmas carols. We have to wait to decorate the sanctuary. We have to wait for Christmas morning. And we have to wait because we've been told if we sing Christmas carols too soon, the bishop will get us. <laughs> right? Perhaps. <laughs> as long as we don't tell, yes. <clears throat> but I don't think that's what Advent waiting is really all about. Instead, Advent waiting is about a promise. A promise. You see, biblical scholars describe the, the very terse opening to the Gospel of Mark as a title. As Simon read, the beginning of the good news of Jesus, the Son of God. The beginning of the good news of Jesus, the Son of God, it's a title. What Mark is saying to us is, this is the promise as it comes from the prophet Isaiah. It's a promise of God to desperate people, God's desperate people, the Israelites, at the lowest point of their history. And the Gospel writer Mark wants us to know that John the Baptist is the beginning, pointing to the fulfillment of the one who is to come who was born in a manger. A promise to Israel, a promise of comfort, deliverance, renewal, that John isn't bringing, but he is pointing to. And so we have this promise that creates an expectation that allows us to wait actively. We can wait for the promise to be fulfilled because a promise denotes that something will happen, a future expectation. And that's what God's promise is all about. A promise fulfilled in a stable in Bethlehem, God's promise is fulfilled in the birth of Jesus. And friends, it's not a pie in the sky claim, it's real, it's honest, and it's truthful. Well, you may be saying, great preacher, we've all seen these pie-in-the-sky claims before, but what makes this promise different? What makes God's promise any different? I'd like to twist that question and see it is a challenge. You see, if God's promise to you and to me and to all the world is something that we don't passively wait to come, then what if God is calling us to join God in the work? What if we're being invited to join God in bringing about a new heaven and a new earth? What about when we reach out to heal, to comfort, to help, to bring peace, to bring justice to our friends, our neighbors, to the world, what about if that is actually God at work in and through you and me? So I'll wrap up this sermon with a question. If we have to wait, what kind of waiting do you want to do? 
Do you want to sit on the couch or in the pew and passively wait? Or do we get off the couch or out of the pew and get involved? Do we spend our time, our energy, our money, our lives to make a difference in the world, in our city, in our community, in our church, right here and now? Or do we sit back and wait for it to happen? Because he, John calls us to wait, but to actively wait, to get involved. All of us right here, right now, actively waiting to make a difference in the lives of people that God has put around us. So you see, God is continuing the story of good news. The beginning of the good news of Jesus in and through your words and your actions, my words and my actions. And when you stop and think about it, how many opportunities do each of us have each and every day, each week, each month, each year, to impact other people? To share in the work that God is doing. Please don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying we are doing God's work. I'm not saying we are preempting God's work, because that's God's job. But we're not passively waiting. We are invited to join God in doing God's work in this world, trusting in the promise that God spelled out in Isaiah and in Mark, right here and right now. And so, friends, this is the kind of active, participatory waiting that John the Baptist and Advent invites us to. May it be so in your life and in mine, this day and forever. Amen. Amen.